All right, for the last video on the chapter on magnetism, uh, we're going to go over the material that relates to questions five, six, and seven on the lecture worksheet. So here, I am first going to introduce the magnetic fields of a long straight wire. And then we're going to do an application of that, which is what we're going to call levitating wires. And then we're going to find for the magnetic field inside of a solenoid. So I'm going to go over the theory uh, as quickly as I can. And then I'm going to show you how to do questions five, six, and seven. Now, uh, Danish scientist Hans Orsted uh, realized while doing some experimentations that a compass needle would uh, deflect when it was placed close to a current carrying wire. And we did a similar experiment, if you want to think of an analogy, where we placed a bar magnet and then we had a compass needle pointing uh, towards the north, the uh, geographic north, at a distance x from this bar magnet. And as we placed or as we moved this compass needle closer and closer towards the bar magnet, then the compass needle would change or would deflect and will point towards a pull on the magnet, okay, depending on the orientation of the bar magnet. So I'm going to introduce a right hand rule, a different right hand rule. So we're going to call this right hand rule number two. And if you want, you can use your pen as the analogy of a current carrying wire. So place your pen on your right hand, and then your thumb is going to point towards the direction where the tip of the pen is. Okay, so just place your thumb on the pen. And so where your thumb is, you have the tip. And therefore, the palm will have the eraser if you, you have a pencil or the back of the pen. Okay, so Using this with a current carrying wire, your thumb is along the direction of the positive current. And then your fingers are going to wrap, naturally wrap or make a curl. And this curl is a direction of the magnetic field given by the current on the wire. So I can really quickly make a um, drawing on this of this so instead of having a pen I'm gonna assume that I have a wire and this wire is going to have a current let's say pointing up and so there's going to be a magnetic field let's make this a plane a magnetic field that's going to follow the right hand rule. So in this drawing, place your thumb on the direction of I, and then curl around I, you're going to have a magnetic field that is going to have a value of B on the left side, and on the right side. And here you can note something, you can note that the curl of B is the same. So it's going to come out, you can think of it as coming out of the screen. At location A, let's say, and then into the screen at location B. And your thumb is still here pointing up if you want. Now, let's find an equation that will give me the magnetic field in terms of I. All right, so the magnetic field will be given by mu naught. I over 2 pi r. And here, mu naught is the permeability of free space. We've used this before, and the value is 4 pi times 10 to negative 7 Tesla meter uh, per amp. All right, I'm going to introduce really briefly Ampere's law. So I can then go to the application, which will be the levitating wire. And Ampere's law is quite simple. 
and we have the following statement. Okay, so we have the sum of the products, which is b parallel times a length segment delta l is equal to mu naught. Forgot the naught here. Times the net current passing through a surface. Okay, so this statement can be written in an equation format which is written right here. So I have the sum of B parallel delta L is equal to mu naught times I. And this equation is fundamental for describing how electric currents create the magnetic fields. Okay. So very quickly, let's go into a very common application and a very common phenomena, which is magnetic fields and magnetic forces between two parallel conductors. So in our case, you can think of two wires. So assume I have two wires, and these two wires have two currents. We can have I1 and I2. So I1 is the current of wire of the first wire, and I2 will be the current of the second wire. Now let's look at two points where which we're gonna have to take into consideration okay so the first thing we have to take into consideration is that the force on wire one due to the magnetic field of wire two because wire two is going to have a current i2 that's going to set a b2 on wire one okay so the second current is going to set a magnetic field. We're going to call this B sub 2 on wire 1. And wire 1, because it has a charge carrier that is in motion, which is what we call a current, and because it's going to have this magnetic field now, there's going to be a force on the wire. So let me go, let me scroll up and let's demonstrate this. So let's take I2. And let's consider I2 for a second. Let's I'm gonna put a dot, which will be the center of the wire for our simplicity. And then I2 is going to have a current going from left to right. If we apply the right hand rule number two on this wire, again, place your thumb in a direction of current I2, and then you can curl your fingers naturally you're going to realize that you're going to make a curl where at this location where we have I1, there is a magnetic field that goes out of your screener page. And then at the bottom here, we're going to have a magnetic field that goes into the screen or page. Okay. So these magnetic fields, I'm going to call these B2. B2 which is the magnetic field given by the second current I2. All right, so now let's apply the right-hand rule number one. Okay, so if you apply the right-hand rule number one, we're going to place our index finger in the direction of I1, our middle finger in the direction of the magnetic field, or you can have the curl a direction of the magnetic field, and our thumb is going to be naturally facing down. So our force is down. And this is force F1 because it's the force that is um, exerted on I1, which is the first current. So in the recap, we have I2 that will create a magnetic field, B2, and due to the magnetic field and the current, then I1 is going to exert a force. Please note that in this example, we have I1 and I2 that are going towards the right, so they are going the same direction. And I'm gonna do, or I'm gonna describe what would happen if the currents would be going opposite directions. Okay. All right, let's quantify this so that we can um, use an equation for questions in the lecture worksheets. So the magnitude 
of the magnetic field B2 will be given by mu naught I2 over 2 pi times the distance, which I use the letter D, because on this diagram, these two wires are a distance D from each other. Okay, in your textbook, you might see delta X or delta Y, um, or just D for distance. All right, so I'm going to use the equation for the force of a current carrying wire. So remember that the force is given to, by B I L sine of the an angle. And if I want to find the maximum force, the maximum force occurs when theta is 90 degrees, making sine of 91. So the maximum force is B I L. Okay. So let me write the force on the first wire will be equal to B I L. The force will be a consequence of the magnetic field from the second wire, so I'm gonna call it B sub two, and the current is for the first wire, one, and then L will be length I. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute B2 that I wrote here on B2 in the force equation. So this equals mu naught I2 over 2 pi D multiplied by I1 times L. And I can rearrange this to write the force per unit length because sometimes we see it in this format which basically means I want to find the force per unit length. Okay, I'm just rearranging this equation a little bit and I have force per unit length in this example, we are focusing on the force of the first on the first wire is equal to mu naught I1 times I2 all over 2 pi times the distance. Okay, so this will be the force per unit length on the wire. And so we have two options when we solve for these current um, carrying wires. So we can either have two wires that have currents that are going um, in the same direction, similar to or exactly as what, what I just showed you. And here I drew the little diagram in yellow to correspond to the yellow writing. So I have I1 going to the right hand side, I2 is going to the right hand side. And what we have is that we have an I1 that's going to have a force going towards I2, I'm going to call this F1. But also, if you do the right hand rule again, we have the second a wire to have a F sub 2 going up. Okay, so they're actually going to have forces towards each other, or they're, in other words, the forces are attract, attractive. And if we have opposite direction, so basically we have a current, in this case, I made I1, I1 going to the left-hand side and I2 is moving towards the right-hand side, then when we do the right-hand rule, we're going to have forces that are going opposite direction, and that's what we're going to call repel each other. Okay, So if we have two wires that are attract have attractive force, then the currents are going in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Two wires that have repulsive forces then the currents are going opposite directions. And this example is actually used to give a further definition of Ampere's law, which is we have two long wires that are one meter apart carrying the same current and a magnetic force per unit length. Here is the force per unit length I introduced in this equation here, 
Okay, so force per unit length. Let me scroll down. Of two times ten to seven newtons per meter on each wire. Then for this to occur, recall the current is going to be defined as one ampere. Okay, so now we have two definitions for the ampere. Remember that the first definitions for ampere is that we have a steady current of one ampere um, in quantity is the charge that flows through any cross-sectional area in one second is one coulomb. Okay, so we have two different definitions for ampere. So with this information, we can complete the question on a levitating wire from the lecture worksheet. Now, before that, let me talk about magnetic fields of current loops and solenoids. So that way we have everything in one video. So the strength of the magnetic field set up by a piece of wire, so magnetic field set up by a wire that carries current can be enhanced at a specific location if we form a loop. Okay. So why is this? I'm gonna show this visually because I think that's the easiest way to see it. Assume I have a loop, which is this blue light blue circle, and then current is going counterclockwise. And let's assume we have two segments, delta x1 at the top and delta x2. And at those two segments, we wanna use right hand rule number two to see which is the direction of the magnetic field given by the current in the wire. So by doing the right hand rule number two, we're gonna place our thumb in the direction of the current, and then we're gonna curl our fingers, and we're gonna see that at the middle of this wire, for delta x1 as well for delta x2, we have a magnetic field that points in the same direction, namely out of your screen or out of the paper. So all segments delta x on the loop produce a magnetic field at the center of the loop that is out of the page okay, in the same direction. So let me draw this. So let's assume I have a wire. Let's make this three, the, two dimensionals. Okay, this could be the wire. This could be your delta x1. Uh, this section can be your delta x2. And then if you apply the right-hand rule, you're going to realize that all the field lines were going out of the page. Okay, and so you have field lines that look like this. Okay. So what does this look like? This looks like a magnet, okay? And that's the whole point. So this drawing will be similar to a magnet where if I have a magnet and I put the north in the top, south here in the bottom end, I can have field lines that are going away from north like I showed you in the previous video towards south. And so that's why we call a solenoid sometimes a electromagnet. Okay. So let's find the magnitude at the center of the loop. So what is the magnetic field at the center of this loop? So we uh, are going to have this equation derived from calculus. So in this instance, I'm simply going to give you the equation. But we have B, which is the magnetic field, is equal to mu naught. I, so mu naught times the current, divided by 2R. Okay. And if you have N loops, then we have B is equal to N times mu naught I over 2R. So n will be the number of loops, mu not constant, i is the current, and then 2 r will be 2 times the radius. All right. 
the magnetic field of a solenoid, okay, so using this idea, we can actually create a solenoid, which is simply a straight wire that is bent into a coil with several closely spaced loops. And that's what we call an electromagnet, as I said a second ago. And the electromagnet equation, or for the solenoid, we have B is equal to mu naught N or times I. And this lowercase n is what we call the turns per unit length. So the turns per unit length would be the number of turns that you have. So if you only have one a loop, you just put a one, divided by the length. And this value is what we put here in this lowercase n. So for the last question in the lecture worksheet, we um, use this equation to find the magnetic field of a solenoid. All right, so let's do the last three questions on the lecture worksheet. All right, question number five, six, and seven will be the five. So for question number five, we have a long straight wire that carries a current of five amps. There's a proton, which is four millimeters from the wire, and it travels at a speed of 1.5 times 10 to the three meters per second parallel to the wire. Okay, in the same direction, important. Of a uh, magnetic field created by the wire. So I'm gonna find the magnetic field created by the wire. So there's different ways to solve this question because if I place the wire like I did from bottom to top, or left to right or an angle, mm -hmm. then your drawing will be a little bit different, but the overall idea or theory is exactly the same. Okay, so we can shift this diagram like clockwise or kind of clockwise, but the diagram or this sketch will be identical. So I'm gonna have a wire, and this wire is has, gonna have a current, and I'm gonna make the current go from uh, the bottom of the wire to the top. So there's a current, Going from the bottom to the top, I'm gonna to call this I. And then I'm gonna place a proton. So just due to spacing, I have a proton, I'm gonna place it at the right-hand side of this wire, because we're not told if it's the right or the left-hand side, but let's place this proton on the right-hand side, and this proton will be at a distance. Let me go back to this distance of four millimeters. So here I have, I'm gonna put a distance of four millimeters, which I'll convert later from this wire. Okay. So the wire is going to create a magnetic field using the second right hand rule. So place your thumb in the direction of wire. So this is going to be a magnetic field that will come out of the page or your screen on the left hand side. And it's actually going into the screen or the page on the right hand side. Okay. Think of like a loop that comes out of the screen into the screen. And we have the charge that will have a velocity parallel to the direction of current. And with this information, we can solve for the magnitude of the magnetic field and also the direction of the force. So let's just find the direction of force really quickly. Let's, just, let's apply the first right hand rule. So again, we have the uh, fingers direction of V. They're gonna curl towards B. So we have fingers pointing up or straight uh, in the direction of I and V. And then you're gonna curl them 90 degrees towards the magnetic field. If you wanna have V curl to B in this orientation, then your thumb is pointing towards this wire. So your force is pointing towards this wire here. Okay, so for part uh, A, we're gonna find the magnitude and direction of B, and the B I showed is shown in this diagram. And for part B, we're gonna find the magnitude and direction of force. Okay, so let's do that. So for the magnitude of B, we have B magnetic field is equal to mu naught I over two pi R which is equal to four pi times 10 to the negative seven 
Tesla meter per amp. This is mu. The current is five amps given in the problem. And then divided by two pi and then four times 10 to a negative three meters, which is the four millimeters. So we have a magnetic field, which would be 2.50 times 10 to the negative four Tesla. Okay. And again, the magnetic field is a vector. So I'm gonna write here the direction. So on the right-hand side of this wire, the direction is into the page, or I guess screen, because we're using virtual tools right now. So into the screen, uh, because the angle between the V, which is the velocity, and V is 90 degrees. All right, so let's do a similar calculation solve for the magnitude direction of the force that's exerted on the proton. Okay, so the force exerted on this proton, I'm gonna write that the force is equal to QVB sine theta. And so this is 1.6 times 10 to negative 19 coulombs charge of a proton. The velocity is 1.50 times 10 to the three third meters per second uh, B I just solved all right 2.5 times 10 to the four and then again here we have sine theta so we have a theta of 90 degrees so sine of 90 degrees will be one all right and this gives me a solution of 6.00 times 10 to negative 20 newtons. Okay, and very important, then again, your fingers will point in the direction of V, you're gonna curl towards B, and so your thumb points uh, to the left, to the left, or towards wire, towards, that's an R, current wire. Okay, so let me scroll up a second. So this force is going to point towards I, so towards this wire, or to the left-hand side. Okay, so that is question number five. So now let's do question number six, which is a levitating wire. So it's actually a very interesting question. So we have two wires that each have one times 10 to negative four Newton per meter. And here I make a point that this is the weight per unit length. Okay, let's look at the units. Weight per unit length. They're placed parallel uh, with one right above the other, directly above the other. Okay. And we have a few details that we're gonna use to solve for the currents in the wire. So the currents are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So if you go back um, in the lecture part, I showed that if you have currents going in the same direction, we'll have a type of force. And if you're going opposite direction, you'll have a different type of force. Okay. In, in, either attractive in the first case or repulsive. The wires are 0.1 meters apart. So that gives us our value of D in the equation that I used previously. And the sum of the magnetic force and gravitational force on the upper wire is zero. So the sum of forces is equal to zero. In other words, we have a system of two wires that is in equilibrium. Okay, so we're gonna find the currents on the wire. So the first part of this problem I'm gonna call it a part is okay. There are opposite wires, so opposite wires. Let me write this here opposite current in the wires will give me a repulsive force. Okay. So let's write the fact that the sum of force is equal to zero. So in this case, I have two forces, 
So I have the gravitational uh, plus, I'm going to here put mag due to magnetic is equal to zero. So if I have two wires on top of the other, I'm going to have the first mg is going to be pointing in that direction. So I have a negative mg plus, um, let's go straight to it, mu naught i1 i2 over 2 pi d l is equal to zero. Okay. Then we have another piece of information that both wires have the same current. So we know that I1 and I2 are the same magnitude. Okay. So here I1 and I2 are the same magnitude. So they're basically just I times I. So in this case, what we have is we actually have I times I, which gives us an I squared. We can call it I1 squared or I2 squared, just I squared. And we have a um, weight per unit length. Let me scroll up a little bit here. We have a weight per unit length value. So in our equation here, we want to have a weight per unit length. So here we have mg, the negative is the direction, but mg, which is what we call the weight, and we have length. So that's how we're going to do, we're going to get the weight per unit length. So let me rearrange this a little bit so it might be easier to see. So I can write mu naught i squared times length over 2 pi d is equal to mg, which is the weight and again i'm going to solve for i that's the whole point of this, per of this problem solve for i so when i solve for i i have i squared is equal to 2 pi d multiplied by mg over L. Okay, so this mg over L is that I moved L to the right hand side and I left it, I combined it because that's the weight per unit length so I can put in the value that I have and divided by mu naught. So algebraically the problem is over. Again, I'll take a square root, but algebraically the problem is over. So let me just plug in the solutions that we have. So the value that we have, so this will give me two pi times uh, 0 0.100 meters multiplied by 1.0 times 10 to the negative 4. This is newtons per meter, run out of space there. Divided by mu naught, which is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 tesla meter. Okay. So this gives us a value of I squared to be 50.0 amps squared. So therefore, I is 7.07 .07 amps. I'll throw a box, and then we're done with that question. All right, so the last question on this lecture worksheet is uh, the magnetic field inside a solenoid. So again, this is a question just, um, I looked, this actually, is, I did not make this question, but I looked for a question that has different components where we can practice to solve for the magnetic field inside a solenoid. So here we have a solenoid that consists of 100 turns. Okay, so we have N, which will be 100 turns of wire, and it has a length of 10 centimeters. So first of all, we're going to find the magnitude of the magnetic field inside when this um, solenoid will carry a current of 0 0.500 amps. Okay. And then part B, we're going to solve for the uh, momentum of a proton. So we're actually going to use uh, centripetal acceleration from 105. And then we're going to solve an approximation of how, many, how much wire we would need to have a certain arrangement. 
So part A first, we're gonna minor self that I'm gonna define lowercase n to be the number of turns divided by length. So we have a hundred turns divided by 0 0.100 0 meters. And this gives us 1.00 times 10 to the third turns per meter. Okay, so we have lowercase n. We can plug it straight to the equation that we have. So we have b is equal to mu naught n i, lowercase n. And we have here 4 pi times 10 to negative 7. Tesla meter amp times 1.00 times 10 to the third turns per meter. And then we have 0.5 amps. So we have a magnetic field that is 6.28 times 10 to the negative 4 Tesla. All right, so this was, was quite simple, plugging in the information that we have. Now, B, we're going to use two, um, two properties or two equations from 105. So the first one, I recall that the momentum is equal to mass times velocity. And the second thing is the centripetal acceleration, A sub C, was V squared over R. Okay, we're going to use these two pieces of information. So we have, find the momentum, it's not my momentum, I forgot two letters. Find the momentum of the proton orbiting inside a solenoid in a circle with a radius of 0 0.02 meters. And then we're giving some ex extra information is the axis of the solenoid is perpendicular to the plane of the orbit. Okay, meaning that we have a perpendicular theta between the plane and the axis to simplify our problem, basically. All right, so I will remember that we have that the maximum force is equal to Q V B max. Again, B max happens when you have an angle of 90 degrees. This is the axis of the solenoid. It's perpendicular, this will be 90 degrees. So sine of 90 is one which is also equal to ma. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to substitute my a in the right-hand side of Newton's second equation, and then I'm going to modify it such that we can get a momentum in terms of qvb. Okay, so let me first write this as I'm gonna write this right hand side first. So I have m multiplied by v squared over r is equal to q v b max. So I'm gonna cancel a v and a v left side and the right side. And I'm gonna move this r to the right hand side because this gives me mv is equal to qb. I can just put a max here to remind us that we have an angle of 90 degrees times r. And so the left hand side, this is mv is the momentum, which is what we call, or we denote with letter p. And this is qb max r. So we have. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs multiplied by 6.28 times 10 to the negative 4 tesla and then r is 0 0.02 meters if it's squeezed it says 0 0.02 meters which is r and this is equal to 2.01 times 10 to the negative 24 kilogram meters per second Okay, so we mixed a little bit of 105 and new material to find the momentum of a proton. And the last question in this lecture worksheet is an approximation. 
is okay, find the length of the wire. So an approximation of the length of the wire will be the number of turns times two pi r, which is um, r given by the radius that we're given the problem. So approximation would be we have a hundred turns multiplied by two pi and then times 0 0.050 uh, meters. Okay, I'm just plug and chug. An approximation will be 31.4 meters. Okay, so this has been quite a longer video, but I introduced the material for questions five, six, and seven, and then the equivalent problems. Okay, so if you have any questions, please, uh, you can write it down in the comments if you want, or send me an email and uh, let me know how it goes. Right. I'll see you in the next one.